in this video we're going to talk about ionic compound and their nomenclature. Uh, to begin with, let's talk about the basic fundamentals of ionic compounds, or another way of saying how they are made. Uh, to, to, be, uh, to start out with, ionic compounds entails the give and take of electrons. Uh, what that really means, if I have a metal, the metals, they like to give up electrons. So when a metal gives the electrons, they make a positive charge cations. On the other hand, the electrons that are lost by the metals will be taken up by the nonmetals. So the nonmetals gain the electrons, and when they gain the electrons, they make the anions, which are going to be the negative charge, and the cations going to be the one that's bearing the positive charge. Okay, so then once you have the cations and the anions made according to the electrostatic attractions, we will have a positive and negative attracting one another, and that's going to be the foundation of the formation of an ionic bond. Uh, once, you, once you have uh, this positive and negative attracting one another, that creates so-called ionic bond in that particular case. So for the most part, when we talk about the ionic compound, it's going to be between the metals and the non-metals because metals are the one that loses electrons, makes cations, and the non-metals are the one that gives, it takes in the electrons and make the anions. All right, but I do want to mention there is a, a polyatomic cation that's also capable of making the ionic compound, and that's going to be the NH4 plus. It's also called the ammonium ion. Because the bottom line is you have to have an a cation and the anion, so it doesn't necessarily all the cation comes from the metals for the most part, except this ammonium ion which only contains the non-metal, but it's still in a cation, so this can still make ionic compounds, so keep that in mind. Okay, so then, once you actually make the ionic compound, you must make sure your charges are balanced. The charge of the cation and the anion must be balanced by one another. And let me uh, take some examples here. Let's assume I have sodium, and the, sodium, the charge on the sodium is 1 plus, and let's assume I have a, a Cl, and the chlorine's charge is going to be 1 minus, and once it gets 1 minus, it's going to be called chloride. Okay, now how do I know the charge on the sodium is 1 plus and the charge on this chlorine is going to be 1 minus? We'll talk that in a minute, but right now I want to kind of talk about how you're going to be balancing these charges. So since I have a 1 plus on the cation, overall a 1 plus charge, and an overall of 1 minus charge, I can take 1 sodium and I can take 1 Cl1 minus to balance out their charges. So at the end of the day, when you put this cation and the anion together, it's just going to be NaCl. And this may sound very familiar. This may look very familiar. It's a sodium chloride. That's the table salt uh, we use in the household. Okay, so then let's take another example. Assume I have uh, uh, aluminum, and the charge on the aluminum is 3 plus, and assume I have an oxygen. The charge on the oxygen, once it makes a um, anion, it's going to be 2 minus, and it's called an oxide at that time. Now, how do I know the charges on those? So hold on to that thought for a minute, but let's learn how you're going to be balancing those charges. So since I have 3 plus on the aluminum and the 2 minus on the oxygen, I want to make sure I have the same charges, same plus charge and the same minus charge in order to balance off these positives and negatives. So what are the possible ways I can do it? I can maybe have another aluminum, so it's going to be Al3+, and that makes a total of 6 plus in that case. And then to make a 6 minus total, I need to have two more oxygens or two more oxides in this case, and that makes a total of 6 minus. So another way of saying you need to have two aluminum, so Al2, and three oxygens to make the compound out of aluminum and the oxide here. Um, and then the other thing you can always do is you can say, okay, this three, that the charge on the cation becomes the subscript of the anion, okay? And the charge on the anion becomes the subscript of 
your cation so you can always do something uh, like this if you have Al3 plus and O2 minus you can say okay this 3 goes on to the subscript of oxygen and this 2 go on to the subscript of aluminum and it works almost 99% uh, of the time there are times when you want to make sure you don't use this rule and I'll give you an example let's assume I have magnesium and sulfur so the charge on magnesium is 2 plus and the charge on sulfur is 2 minus and uh, um, like I said I'll talk about how you get those charges in a minute now how do I balance those charges well don't use that uh, subscript rule here uh, where you say okay this 2 goes on to the sulfur and this 2 goes on the magnesium don't do that because you technically need only one magnesium and you only need one sulfur to balance off the charges so if you need only one of those I can go ahead and write this formula as to be MGS so it's going to be magnesium sulfide in that case okay so make sure your charge is going to be balanced uh, when you putting the uh, anion and the cation together uh, and let me take one more example before we move on to the next thing let's assume I have uh, manganese 2 plus and I got this SO4 2 minus okay so this is an polyatomic anion that we'll talk about in a bit, minute but then again the bottom line is you're still gonna have to balance out the positive and negative and seems like you got 2 plus here and uh, 2 minus here so you, you already have all those balanced so you need one of the magnesium and one of the sulfur uh, one of the sulfate to just offset the the charges okay well let's take another example what if I have uh, magnesium and chloride okay so this is going to be and magnesium is going to be two plus and chloride is one minus so to balance out the charges so I have a total of two plus charge on magnesium I need a total of two minus now to get a two minus I would need to have one more chloride there so when you put them together it's going to be magnesium MgCl2 as your formula okay well how do you know what the charge is going to be on those cations and on the anions? Um, for, some, uh, for, for some of them, you can focus on the position of their of position in the, in the periodic table, and especially for the monatomic ions. If you have a, an ion, whether it's in a cation or the anion, coming from in a single atom, then you can more or less rely on the location on their location in the periodic table okay so let's look at uh, metals that have fixed charges now remember the metals are the one they're gonna make the positive charges and uh, we're gonna look at the metals of group 1a okay so the group 1a is right there uh, the metals of group 2a and the metals of group 3a okay so make sure you are familiar with where your uh, groups gonna be so let me uh, change the colors here so your group 1a metals are also called alkali metals and the charge on those is basically whatever valence electrons you're gonna have so alkali metals gonna have a plus one charge so whether you have a lithium or uh, a sodium or potassium all these guys they're gonna have a plus one charge when they make ionic compound so they do have a very fixed charge when it comes to making ionic compound now how do you why do they really do that it's all about getting to the stable electronic configuration or stable noble gases so they all those elements in the alkali metals like for example sodium is one electron ahead than the neon okay so if it loses one electron it becomes like neon if I take an example of the rubidium rubidium is one electron ahead than your krypton here alright so if it loses one electron it becomes like krypton so more or less a lot of these elements they try to become like noble gases either by losing electrons gaining electrons or by the at the end by sharing electron we'll talk about that later uh, so you have to kind of see their position and ask yourself okay how many electron it should lose in order to fall back onto the noble gases so alkali metals they are one electron ahead they will lose one electron and when they lose one electron they make one plus charge so for example lithium would have a one plus charge sodium would have a one plus charge and so on okay what about the second uh, Let's talk about these group 2 metals. The group 2 metals are also called uh, 
alkaline earth metals and you actually want to ask the same question these group 2 metals are two electrons ahead than their respective or closest noble gases and they since they have two electrons as well two valence electrons they will lose those two valence electron so when they lose two electrons they will get a plus two charge on them uh, so for example I can say beryllium is going to have a two plus charge or I can say uh, calcium is going to have a two plus charge and so on so all these second group metals going to have a two plus charge okay so then let's look at the group three elements so your group three elements are going to be these uh, aluminum gallium and indium okay so remember this is your group three right there and the only metals we really worry about in group three is aluminum gallium and indium boron is a metalloid so we don't really worry about that and below indium which is like a thallium that more or less behaves like transition metals so we'll talk about that in a minute so then this these guys they have three valence electron doesn't necessarily have any particular name for this group but they do have three valence electrons and they like to lose three electrons so when they lose three electrons they do get a plus three charge on them so that means when aluminum makes compound it's gonna have a three plus charge when gallium makes compound it's gonna have a three plus charge and even indium when it makes compound it's gonna have a three plus charge so those are the first three groups you have to really worry about and they have the fixed charge make sure you know which groups has the fixed charge and which metal is going to have a non a fixed charge or the variable charges any other metals you have in the periodic table so like the rest of these metals in the periodic table uh, will have the variable charges and that's including the transition metal and that's a big chunk of the metal so you can kind of see how all these metals right there they're gonna have uh, variable charges okay so how do you figure out the charge on those since they have variable charges you cannot rely on the position uh, in the periodic table so to figure out the charge you rely on the anion and we'll talk about that when it comes into the play so you rely on the charge on the anion in those cases to figure out what the charge is going to be on those transition elements okay so that's your metals okay group one two three have the fixed charges the rest of the metal is going to have variable charges how do you figure out the charge on those uh, elements that has variable charges you rely on your anion okay so we'll talk about that when it comes okay so for example how do you how do you really name these uh, cations and the anion uh, cations it's actually very easy the name of the cation is the same as the name of the metal for example sodium okay well let me ask you this what charge sodium is gonna have when you go back in there sodium is in group 1a okay so that means it's gonna lose one electron and if it loses one electron it will have a one plus charge on it so it will make one plus charge and when it comes to naming this it uh, it's Na1 plus it's just going to be sodium ion so you don't really change anything in there okay what about magnesium what charge magnesium is going to get so you go back and look up the position in the periodic table uh, magnesium is in group 2a so that means it will lose two electrons so when it loses two electron it gains two plus charge so that's going to be magnesium ion okay what about this CO which is cobalt now when we look where the cobalt is okay the problem with the cobalt cobalt is actually going to be in uh, uh, the transition element so it's going to be CO that's uh, atomic number of 27 so since it's a transition element it will have a variable charges now right so I don't really know what the charge gonna be on this cobalt at a given minute because I don't have its anion but let's assume it gets a 2 plus so it's just more like an assumption it could get in a 2 plus or it could get in a 3 plus at a given time so even though it's in a transition metal making an a cation the name really doesn't change it's still gonna be cobalt ion okay what about this aluminum what's the charge going to be on the aluminum let's go back here and see where that is in the periodic table aluminum is in group 3a uh, atomic number is uh, 13 
So that means it's since it's in group 3A, it's going to lose three electrons. So when it loses three electron, it'll get a three plus charge. And when it comes to naming, like any other cation, it's just going to be aluminum ion. Okay. Okay, so then you may have to worry about just some of the polyatomic cations. And there is actually only two polyatomic anions you really have to worry about. One of them is uh, NH4+, plus, and it's called an uh, ammonium ion. And you have to worry about how, uh, you have to know how the ammonium ion looks like, what the formula is, what the charge is. Ammonium ion is going to be the only one that involves in the actual covalent, in the ionic compounds. There is another one that's called an H3O+. Plus. H3O+, plus doesn't really make any ionic compounds, but you want to make sure you are aware of those as well. Sometimes the teacher asks you those questions. So it's going to be hydronium ion. Okay, so those are the only two polyatomic cations you have to really worry about. And for the most part, ammonium is the one that's going to make a lot of ionic compounds. Okay, well, that's for the metals. How about the nonmetals? How do you know what the charge is going to be on the nonmetals? Now, remember, nonmetals, they actually gain electrons. So if something gains electron, it actually gets a negative charge. Now, the idea still stays the same. It's like, okay, I want to make sure I get to the closest noble gas when I'm losing, when I'm gaining the electrons in this case. Okay, so this is the noble gas we have right there, group 8A. So let's look at maybe group 7A, this particular one that's called the halogens. All right, so let's focus on the halogens first. So halogens are, they do have seven valence electrons, but in this case, you don't want to look at the valence electrons, but you actually want to look at how far away you are from your noble gases. So since you're only one electron away from the noble gas in this particular case, you will, they will like to gain one electron and behave like noble gases. For example, chlorine is one electron away from argon. Bromine is one electron away from the krypton. So all these guys, they will like to gain one electron to behave like noble gases. So I can say uh, they gain one electron. So if they do gain one electron, what the charge is going to be on them? Well, it's going to be negative one charge on them. So that means uh, a fluorine would have a one minus charge, chlorine would have a one minus charge, and then uh, uh, bromine would have a one minus charge along with iodine having a one minus charge. So they also have a fixed charge, and that's true when they're making ionic compound. All right, so keep that in mind. Uh, they must be making ionic compounds when they when we're looking at these charges. Um, okay, what about uh, the other one? Let's look at. Uh, Maybe this uh, oxygen family right there, which is in group 6A. So what do you guys think? How many, uh, the only atom you really have to worry about in oxygen family is actually oxygen, sulfur, and selenium. Below selenium, which is tellurium, it's more like a metalloid, so it's going to behave a little bit differently. So then in, in this particular case, uh, how many electrons oxygen family would gain to become like noble gases. So they are actually only two electrons away if you look at their position with respect to the noble gases. So they gain two electrons, all right? So they will gain two electrons. So when they gain two electrons, what charge are they gonna get? Well, of course, they're gonna get a two minus charge. So that's gonna be oxygen two minus, uh, that's gonna be sulfur two minus, and that's going to be SE2 minus. So their name's going to be different, so I'll talk about that in a minute. But that's how you figure out what the charge is going to be on those. Uh, well, let's focus on the next one. Let's look at the nitrogen family. The elements you really have to worry about in the nitrogen family is the nitrogen and the phosphorus only. Okay, so in, in that, uh, nitrogen is three electrons away from the noble gas. Phosphorus is also three electrons away from the noble gas, so they would like to gain three electrons to become like noble gases. So I can say they will gain three electrons. So when they gain three electrons, they would get a three minus charge on them, okay? 
So that means when I write those in the ionic compound, it, nitrogen is going to have a 3 minus charge and phosphorus is also going to have a 3 minus charge and so on. Okay, then group 4A, uh, the only element you really have to worry about in group 4A is going to be the carbon, okay? And uh, beca that's because the right below carbon is a silicon, which is a metalloid, so we don't really worry too much about the metalloids naming yet. So if it's rare carbon makes an ionic compound, but if it does make an ionic compound, what do you guys think? How many electrons should it gain? Well, you use the same rule. It's only, it's actually four electrons away from the closest noble gas, so it should gain four electrons. So it gains four electrons, and if it does gain four electrons, it's going to get a four minus charge, and the carbon would have like a four minus charge that looks like this. Okay, so to end this, I can say group uh, halogen family, that's going to be up to iodine only. Okay, so that would have a one minus charge. I can write, just write that down here. The oxygen family, oxygen, sulfur, selenium, will get a two minus charge. And then uh, the nitrogen phosphorus will have a three minus charge. And then carbon will have a four minus charge when they're making the ionic compound. Well, there is one more non-metal that we didn't really talk about, and that's actually hydrogen. All right, so what do you guys think? What's the charge going to be on the hydrogen? If you look at the hydrogen, hydrogen is only one electron away from the closest noble gas, which is the helium, okay? So it will gain only one electron. So hydrogen likes to gain one electron, and when it gains one electron, it makes a charge of one minus. So it's going to be a hydrogen one minus, okay? All right, so that's how you figure out what the charge is going to be on these anions when you're making ionic compounds. And uh, um, a lot of, or mo most of these anions are going to have fixed charges uh, when, it's, when you're making the ionic compounds. Okay, well, let's look at how you actually name these uh, anions. Uh, naming anions is going to be a little bit different. Uh, so chlorine, what charge chlorine gets? Well, let's go back and look up at the periodic table. The chlorine is going to be in group 7A, so that means it gains one electron, having a charge of one minus. So when, since it has a charge of one minus, when it comes to naming, the last part of the non-metal gets replaced by ide. So that's the difference in the naming of the cations and the anions. The cations, you don't really change much, but the anions, you do change uh, the name, the last part of the name, and replace by ide. So this chlorine, once it gets a one minus charge, it becomes chloride ion. Okay. What about this uh, oxygen? So this oxygen, well, what's the charge going to be on the oxygen? If you go back and look up its position, it's in group 6A, which means it will gain two electrons to become like a noble gas. So when it gains two electrons, it becomes O2 minus. Now, what's the name going to be? Well, it's not going to be oxygen anymore, but rather it's going to be an oxide ion. Okay, well, let's look at the next one, which is nitrogen. What's the charge going to be on the nitrogen? Well, it seems like we got, uh, it's going to have a three minus charge on the nitrogen because it's three electrons away from the noble gas. So it's going to be three minus, and once nitrogen gets three minus charge it's not called nitrogen anymore it's going to be called a nitride ion okay and then hydrogen we talked about that it's going to have a one minus charge it's going to have a name hydride ion okay so the bottom line is you keep the base uh, name for the element but the last part of the element name would get replaced by ide when you're naming the ionic, uh, when you're naming these anions. Okay, so anytime you see an ide, that technically means the uh, this particular compound or this particular uh, non-metal or anion is coming straight from the periodic table. There are a few exceptions. There are a few examples that ends with ide, but they're not strictly coming from the periodic table. I'll tell you that in a bit. Uh, but make sure you practice naming these. Like, for example, sulfur would be called sulfide. Selenium would be called selenide. 
phosphorus would be called phosphide and so on. Okay, then you also want to make sure you can memorize some of these polyatomic anions name. And uh, there, there are some tricks that you can use to memorize these uh, polyatomic anions name. Uh, if, you, if your polyatomic anions ends with eight, like in this case, phosphate, it would have the maximum number of oxygen. So the formula for the phosphate is PO4 three minus. And then if you have something that ends with it, like the next, the very next one is phosphite, then the formula for that one is going to be one less oxygen than the maximum, which is going to be PO3, 3 minus. The charge just stays the same, but it's just the number of oxygens when it comes from going eight to it. Okay. So for example, if I look at uh, sulfate, all right, so sulfate is uh, also have four oxygen as maximum, SO4, two minus. But when I look at sulfite, it will have one less oxygen. So that's how you're gonna have to memorize those as you're going along. And if you put in a hydrogen in front of it, then it becomes in a bicarbonate. It's, it becomes in a bi, or you can say hydrogen. Um, so then uh, let's say uh, there is, for example, this chlorate. If you have a chlorate, the maximum number of oxygens in, in that particular case is going to be 3, which is ClO3, 1 minus. Now, when you use per, okay, so like the top one there, when you use per in front of the chlorate, then you would have one extra oxygen than the maximum you could have in the chlorate. So that's when it becomes ClO4, 1 minus. Okay, and then Obviously, when you have chlorate, which is ClO3, 1 minus, when you go back down to chloride, what's going to happen? You will have one less oxygen. So in that case, it's going to be ClO2, 1 minus. Now, even if you go from chloride to hypochlorite, so now you're going below chloride, and when you go below chloride, you will have even one less oxygen than the chloride. So it's going to become ClO, 1 minus, and that's going to be called in hypochlorite and so on. Okay, so this is how you're going to be, that's a small trick on memorizing these, so make sure you uh, guys memorize these. A lot of times uh, teachers ask you to memorize these polyatomic anions, and uh, there may be times when teacher lets you uh, bring in a cheat sheet to and be able to use, uh, write those up. But for the most part, you may have to memorize these. Okay, so like I said earlier, if you have an if you have an anion that ends with id, most likely it's coming from the periodic table, except these two right there. Okay, so one of them is a CN one minus that's called a cyanide ion. Even though it has an id at the end, it's not a monatomic anion. It's an polyatomic anion. And the other one is the hydroxide, which is an OH minus. And even though it has an ide at the end, it's still in a polyatomic anion. So make sure you're aware of those. Okay, so then let's let's figure out, let's talk about how you actually name these. So there is two ways you're going to be naming these. Obviously, we looked at the metals that have the fixed charges. Okay, and then we looked at the metals that have non-fixed charges. So then when you looking at a compound that contains the metal with a fixed charge, all you really got to do, say the name of the cation and say the name of the anion, and that's it, okay? So what that really means, assume I have this compound that looks like this, MgCl2. Now this MgCl2, I know it's an ionic compound. That's the very first question you have to ask yourself. Make sure you are able to distinguish this from an covalent compound. That we'll talk about that in a separate session. So this contains a metal, which is magnesium, and a non-metal. So obviously it's an ionic compound. The next question you want to ask yourself is: This metal coming from the fixed charges group? which means group 1A, 2A, or 3A. Those are the metals that have a fixed charge. If it does so, like in this case, it does come from a fixed charge, then all you really, really got to do, name the cation and name the, name the anion. So in this case, it's going to be uh, the magnesium chloride. Okay, let's take another example. What if you have... 
something like CaOH2. Okay. All right. So I can see the OH is not a typical uh, anion you see coming from the periodic table, but OH rather is an polyatomic anion. And remember, the OH has an one minus charge. And what's the charge going to be on Ca? Well, Ca is in a group 2A metal. So make sure you go back and look up the periodic table where the Ca is. Since it's in a group 2A metal, it's going to have a 2 plus charge. And each of those uh, OH is going to have one minus charge. So that's why you have two of the OHs there to make sure you balance out the positives and negatives. But, you know, when it comes to naming this, let's look at it. We have the calcium coming from uh, uh, coming from the metals that have a fixed charge. So all you really got to do, name the cation and name the anion. That's it. So it's going to be calcium hydroxide. Okay, that's all you really have to do. Um, okay, then the question could have been like, okay, you are either given the formulas and you have to figure out the name, or you're given the name and you have to figure out the formula. So you want to make sure you can go back and forth uh, both ways. And I'll do a couple of examples in a bit. In a bit. Okay, what about the compounds that containing the variable charges? Okay, and that's where you're going to be using the Roman numerals to specify the charge on the metal. So in that case, you write down the cat name of the cation, and then you'll have some Roman numerals in between the cations and the anion's name. And that's the only difference you're going to have. So this Roman numerals that you're going to have in this parentheses is going to be the charge on the cation. Okay? So for example, let me write down this, M-N-O. Now this M-N, which is the manganese, is actually a transition element. And I don't know the charge on it because they could have a variable charges. And what I had said earlier, how do you figure out the charge on those? Well, we said you rely on your non-metal. Okay, so your non-metal is an oxygen here. And what's the charge on oxygen? Well, look it up in the periodic table and figure out what the charge on the oxygen is going to be. Oxygen is in group 6A, which means it will gain two electrons. And when it gains two electrons, it's going to have a two minus charge. So if oxygen has two minus charge, and we know this two minus must be balanced by the two plus, oh, by the plus charge, so manganese must have a two plus charge on it. All right, because there's only one oxygen, one manganese, so they must balance out each other's charges. So now I can say it's going to be manganese. And now i got to specify the charge on it. It's going to be manganese 2 oxide. So that's how you're going to be specifying the name, uh, the charge on these metals anytime you're getting in a variable, uh, anytime you're getting in a variable charged metals or the transition metals. Okay, well, let's take another example. What if you have COCl3? Okay, so let's figure out the charge on that. Uh, let's figure out the name of that. So obviously, cobalt is a transition element. I don't know the charge on that, so I'll just write that down for a minute. I got three chlorides here, and what's the charge on the chloride? Well, look it up in the periodic table. It's in group 7A, so they all have one minus charge. So that means I'll have one minus charge on each of these chlorines. And uh, this one minus charge collectively will make a three minus charge. Okay, so to balance out this three minus charge, you must have a three plus charge on this cobalt. So when you write down the name, it's going to be cobalt. 3 chloride. Okay? Now, like I said, you could be given the formula and you have to figure out the name, or you could be given out the name as well. What if I have something like, let's say, nickel 2 phosphate? Okay? So here it actually tells you what the charge is going to be. On nickel so I can just go and write it down here so nickel has a symbol of ni and this name actually tells you the charge on nickel which is going to be 2 plus and then I can write down the phosphate on the side as well 
And what's the charge? What's phosphate? Well, phosphate is the polyatomic anion you have to memorize. So it ends with eight, so it's going to be PO4 three minus. So that means it's going to be how much of nickel you should have and how many of the phosphates you should have to balance out the charge of one another. Well, this 2 plus and 3 minus are not a multiple of one another. So what you can do, you can multiply those uh, by one another to get a total of 6 plus 6 charge. So that means I can have 3 of the nickels because three of the nickels all together will have a six plus charge and I can have one more phosphate so when I have one more phosphate it will have a total of six minus charge so that how that's how you're going to be balancing out these charges and then when you put it when you put it together it's going to be Ni2 and Ni3 rather and PO4 and since it's going to be 2, so let me just make sure I make sure, uh, specify that. So P of 4, you need 2 of those. So when you're putting down 2 here, don't, just don't leave 2 like this because it's going to look like this 2 only belongs to the oxygen. So when it's, anytime you are using multiples of the polyatomic anion or the cations, you must have the parentheses around the cation or the anion in that case. So you want to make sure you use the parentheses in this case. So like I said, for the most part, these uh, transition elements are going to have variable charges. There are few of them that has fixed charge. All right, so I will not specify that. Zinc always going to be 2 plus. All right, and then silver is actually always 1 plus. So the, you may see times where uh, you see the name of an ionic compound that entails either zinc or the silver, and they don't really specify the, the charges of those in the Roman numerals. That's because zinc is always 2 plus and silver is always 1 plus. All right. So sometimes they do specify, sometimes they don't. Uh, just do something you want to keep in mind that, that you do have a couple of transition elements that have a fixed charges. Okay, so before we move on, let's do one more example. What if I want to name, what if I want to write down the formula for this? Uh, assume I have aluminum sulfate. Okay, the first thing, like I said, you want to make sure you ask yourself if it's a ionic compound or a covalent compound. And indeed, it's an ionic compound. We have aluminum in there, okay? And that's going to be your metal. And your sulfate is the polyatomic anion. It doesn't, this does not come straight from the periodic table. So aluminum, what's the charge going to be on aluminum? Well, if you look up in the periodic table, aluminum is 3 plus. And what's sulfate? Sulfate is going to be 2 minus, okay? SO4, 2 minus. So now... Uh, when you uh, when you're putting them together, I must have two aluminum. So if I have another aluminum that gives you a six plus charge, and it, I must have a uh, two more, or I can just say three here, three of the sulfates to get a total of six minus charge. Okay. So when you put the aluminum and the sulfate together in the form of the formula, it's going to be Al two because you're using two aluminums and SO4, 3. Since you're using three of those, and since it's in the polyatomic anion, you want to make sure you write that in the parentheses. So that's how you're going to be writing the names of uh, names of these ionic compounds and the formulas of these ionic compounds. So make sure there's only two rules when you're naming the ionic compounds. You focus on the metal, where the metal is coming from. If the metal is coming from the fixed charges group, then you just write down the name of the cation and the anion. If the metal is coming from the transition elements, then you have to specify the charge on the metal by writing that in the Roman numerals in the name. All right, hopefully this was helpful, and I have another video posted for the covalent compounds.